This is the Untangled Knitting Podcast, and my name is Lily. I'm coming from, to you from Oakland, California, where I live with my family, my husband and two kids. I am an art curator by day and a knitter by night. I am here to talk about my knitting projects and how I approach the craft and thank you so much for joining me. If you're new, welcome. And if you're a returning viewer, welcome back. I'm really excited today. We're just gonna be doing a quick recap about the Rhinebeck Yarn Festivals that I attended a couple weeks ago. As I mentioned, I'm based in California, but I was lucky enough to have a reason in addition to yarniness to be back east. My amazing cousin Brooke got married. Um, it was a really amazing celebration. She married a wonderful man who's from um, a Punjabi background and we had an epic four-day wedding. The combination of the Scottish cultures and the Punjabi Indian cultures were just fantastic and it was really exciting. It was also really fun because I got to bring my kiddos and my husband and I got to show them around New York City, which is where we lived together for quite a while before they were born. So that was really nice. Um, so yeah, what am I going to talk about? Basically just a little recap of the yarniness. I'll talk about my Rhinebeck sweater, which is done, both sleeves. Um, for those of you who follow me on Instagram, you may have seen that I did not entirely finish in time for the meetup um, of folks who, who knit this sweater together, but you know what? I'll get into it later. It's It was fine. It was totally fine. So I'll talk about Rhinebeck sweaterness. I'll talk a little bit about um, what my kind of trip was like and hopefully intersperse some images and video of where we went and what we did. And then talk about all the woolly places. Uh, and then I'll get into what I bought, which I also discussed in my last episode in my kind of acquisition section. And I'm really happy with it. Not over the top, just kind of I think I nailed it. So it is a beautiful fall day here in the Greater Bay Area. It was nice and crisp in San Francisco yesterday. I got to wear another sweater. It's just like prime sweater weather here. So I, I hope everyone in the Northern Hemisphere is enjoying that. And I hope my Southern Hemisphere viewers are getting ready for their lighter knits. You know, it's a transitionary season. Who knows, wherever you are on that journey, welcome. So yes, this is the Rhinebeck sweater designed by Andrea Mowry. And it was designed in collaboration with two yarn companies, Magpie Fibers and Spin Cycle Yarns. I used some of their yarns, but not all of them. And I actually have a little clip that I forgot about completely, but I recorded like a whole how I picked my yarn for this sweater video at some point. So maybe I'll resurrect that and, and um, get into it. But I, I do really love the sweater. I added in this corrugated um, ribbing on the neck to go with the corrugated ribbing on the bottom. I made mine the spin cycle color changing yarn that I did use is called Ghost Ranch and I love it. Definitely a top color for me. And then for the Magpie Fibers Plume, which is their lace weight cashmere, I use the color Tactical, which I had a lot a lot of ins and outs with um, choosing what this fuzz was going to be, what color it was going to be. Um, interested parties can always check out previous episodes for full in my head debates <laughs> about what to use there. But what I was really committed to actually was um, the main color, which is Helix, which is by La Bienname. 
and it's a very thin yarn and I held it with um, a corresponding mohair but I held it double in the yoke section where I did the color work and I'll get a little closer so you can check it out. I do think it looks nice. Um, I am getting a little bit of pop still even after blocking in this plume colorway and I just think it's a difference of gauge between or drape even maybe between these two basically having a different fabric between these two fabrics here it is just popping a teeny bit I don't think it's because of the color work my floats are caught I don't know we'll see it might just kind of relax out too but that that's my only fit note otherwise I've made many a Andrea Maori circular yoke color work pattern this fits very consistently. Um, you know, frankly, it, it fits a lot like the everyday sweater, DRK everyday. It's a very, very similar construction, um, only with the added color work in it. So, yes, this is the, this main color is the La Bienname Helix held with La Bienname Silk Mohair. And then the pink is another La Bienname color way in, um, uh, Bois de Rose, Rosewood, and I think it looks really, really nice all together. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if my camera wants to play nice. Yes, it does. And get you some really nice little color moments there. And you can see that transition, which is quite nice, um, between the colors. And I do really, really love that I was able to find this kind of same similar this the screen is called tactical and that same kind of army tactical green part of the spin cycle yarn is where I started so you really do get that sense of continuation in the colorways so those are kind of my modifications to the pattern I love it I am a little bummed that I wasn't able to be at the meetup but because I hadn't finished one of my sleeves I didn't feel entirely bad um, I am drinking some Smith's Tea, which is a Portland tea maker. Um, this is their Rose City Gin Matcha, which I thoroughly enjoy. Uh, it's a green tea with rose petals and toasted rice. It's lovely. Yeah, definitely a tea day. So that that's my Rhinebeck sweater. I really, really love it, and it was really fun on the day I went to the Sheep and Wool Festival to see so many people in this sweater. I mean, there must have been a couple hundred. It was pretty remarkable. And yeah, that was, <laughs> that was pretty exciting. Um, but how did we get there? So I, as I mentioned, I was going to New York for this family wedding. Actually, it was in Southern New Jersey. We stayed in New Jersey and came into the, went into New York City a couple of times with the kids. It was amazing. We took them to all our old apartments that we lived in and they ran around Central Park and, you know, my daughter doing cartwheels in the sheep meadow was just beyond, just really, really exciting for me. Um, it was really nostalgic and, and quite beautiful. So that was really special. And then we went upstate after the wedding was over to a town a little ways away from Rhinebeck called Stanfordville, which was super, super beautiful. Very small town, but really picturesque. Like babbling brooks and forests and a little bit of hunting. It was it was definitely noticeable that it was hunting season had just started. We heard a few um, pops when we were off on a hike and thought, hmm, interesting. Um, so that was that was a little cultural moment, and it was just so beautiful. It was also a really fun place to run. When I was doing my long runs for my marathon training, I got to go in some really beautiful neighborhoods and just be in perfect running weather. I mean, it was sunny and like 64. It was just perfect. And crisp air and really, really delightful. So I feel super lucky to have had that kind of autumnal experience. 
and frankly to be able to share it with my kids. I mean, they had never been, my son is a pandemic baby. He was born before the pandemic started, but he didn't, you know, really get to exist in <laughs> as a, any meaningful way. I mean, he was just a few months old when um, the lockdown started here in California. And I actually had gone back to work, it was when I was working at an art museum, and I had gone back to the office for three days after my maternity leave when we were all sent home. So he really had never, he'd never been on an airplane before. My daughter had been on a plane, but again, she was three the last time she went. So for us, this was a pretty big moment for our family, just kind of having a far away travel experience, being together for that extended amount of time outside of our normal routines. Um, I was just really proud of them. They did such an amazing job. I was kind of in awe. And yeah, kids are, kids are amazing. Really remarkable remarkable people. So we really enjoyed our time upstate. My son was super into the frogs at this house we were staying in, had this little pond, and uh, it was really, really sweet. And I was also really lucky that my parents were able to come with us, so they came up with us from the wedding and we all just stayed in a big farmhouse and it was really, really, really nice and really different, different kind of experience for us West Coasters. So that was really special. And so we got there, we kind of decompressed from all the family, busyness, big events. I mean, we had almost every night there was an event till almost midnight. So we had kept the kids on California time. So that was really fun because they got to hang out with us and do all the fun things and just be in major family mode. Then the wooliness started. I did send my husband off to play golf on the, so we, we went upstate on Tuesday and then he got Wednesday just like full on, none of my family, just him and his golf clubs and a beautiful New England fall day. So I felt like that was, you know, I really had to pay it forward. <laughs> and I then on Thursday was able to go to Woolen Folk, which was such a special event. I didn't really know what to expect. I knew that the New York Sheep and Wool Festival was going to be at a big fairgrounds. I knew that there was going to be lots of vendors, but for New York Sheep and Wool, I really didn't have a lot of expectations. And I think one of the most exciting parts of that adventure was definitely the venue itself. So the Hutton Brickyards is a redeveloped, abandoned brickyard. It was a foundry where they made bricks and those bricks then went on to build basically Manhattan. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And they had these beautiful giant now sculptural looking, but at the time, you know, actually working lifts that would then put all the stacks of bricks onto the containers, onto the ships that would take all the bricks down the Hudson River and into Manhattan and New York City. And it was just frankly spectacular to be in this venue where folks had a vision. They said, these are this is a beautiful location on the Hudson River, a beautiful natural environment, and these are really significant historic building structures that were used to build our culture, really, and to kind of um, put everything together. It's part of our history. And so they turned it into an events venue. And I think there's also a hotel attached. Um, we didn't stay at the hotel. There's a, a nice looking restaurant, which we also didn't eat at. But just that part of it itself was kind of surprising. Um, you know, looking at these abandoned industrial sites with a new eye to kind of what sorts of ways they can contribute to local economies and to the way that we interact with each other is it's kind of interesting. Um, not something I don't know a lot about, but I'm super, super interested in. 
So the venue itself, super cool, really beautiful. And the energy was also really great. Um, we got there, it started at noon. We got there around one. I went with my mom who was so awesome. I'm so glad that we were able to do this together and kind of rolled up and it was just really fun to see everybody getting out of their cars and their sweaters. It was like, we made it, we found our people. And so we parked down by this little beach area by the water and then walked around um, a little ways to the venue. And it was genuinely remarkable. I think all the security crews were kind of curious about who these people were. I, I imagine that they get lots of different sub um, subcultures, you know, who come and use the facilities and do events. And, uh, you know, I did let them know to look alive because these knitters, there's something else, you know, they look all soft and cozy on the outside, but we can be a little edgy. But really, it was such a chill group of people. It was really fun, and I wasn't sure what to expect in terms of how folks would interact together, not just because we're coming out of pandemic, but also because I definitely found folks who we like recognized each other and it was really, really fun to have those moments of recognition and connection was, it was awesome. So my, um, actually we were standing in line, we had already bought our tickets and we were standing in line to get our wristbands and the very first person that we talked to was someone who watched the channel. So it was really, really nice to kind of have that immediate feedback and that immediate sense of connection and community. And it was a viewer who came from outside of Chicago and traveled the whole way uh, on her own in order to delve into this craft. And I just thought that was so special and really fun and great. I, I saw her throughout the venue and we always commented on what each other were picking up and squishing and it was just a really nice way to start the proceedings. And from there we we really needed to eat. So we got so we got in, we made a little bit of a strategic error in terms of the like speed in which we would get sandwiches. There were lots of delicious looking sandwiches there. We picked the sandwich supplying location with only one person making sandwiches, which again, were delicious, but definitely involved like an hour plus wait. So that was maybe not a great strategy. But in the meantime, we had a cider and we hung out by the water and just kind of had our own private fashion show watching people go by. And one of the things my mom kept saying, which I loved, was that it was so wonderful to see these garments moving and to see them not on a flat screen. And that's something I think about a lot, is that we're interacting with a three-dimensional craft, but we're doing it a lot of times, those of us who participate in social media or work, um, you know, connect with each other online via YouTube like this, is that we're actually seeing these three-dimensional objects on a flat screen and they don't always communicate properly. So I just thought that was a really great commentary and something to really keep in mind is that not only are these garments that we're wearing, you know, living, breathing on our bodies, but they're also fully objectified, right? They're whole, they're not just flat. And the notion of kind of flatness is really interesting to me as someone who's has a background in art history and particularly in the history of painting. And it's, it's something that's actually come up a lot with a, an artist I'm currently working with. So that's something that I'm, I'm thinking about and I, I encourage all of us to kind of add into our conversations around what we're making. Um, you know, we even call the photographs that folks take from above of their knitting projects, you know, those are quote unquote flat lays. And what does a flat lay really tell us about the, the object. I mean, I think it can communicate quite a bit, but it also leaves out a lot. So it was really special just to see people walking around in their garments and to be able to witness those as kind of fully flushed out objects 
and embodied objects. So definitely one of the biggest takeaways for me of, of the whole experience. And yeah, it was really fun to just kind of keep running into folks. I saw a lot of knitters who were able to come up to me, my Marin crew, woo woo, really lovely to meet you guys in person. And we had a really nice little meetup too with just a few folks on the patio. I had a moment of crisis where I left my yarn that I had just bought in another stall and I thought I had just gone to the restroom. This is super embarrassing, but I had gone to the restroom and I was like convinced that I had left my bag full of yarn that I had purchased in the stall and I was like, oh no. So I was basically waiting outside the stall that I had been in like accosting the woman coming out like, is there a bag in there? There was not. Um, luckily my mom is super aware of her surroundings and she thought I had left it in a booth where, and actually in the pom-pom booth, where they have, been, I had been like drooling over this sweater that's inspired by Hilma Afklimt, which is, um, uh, who is a, a, a painter, that the Guggenheim did a show about a couple years ago. I was so obsessed with this exhibition of this really, in a lot of ways, unknown painter that I, I bought the catalog before the show even came out. I was just so enamored of it. And it was it's, it's just amazing to see the crossover, right, between my two worlds sometimes. So I was drooling over this sweater inspired by an artist who I really love and completely forgot some of the yarn I bought. So in any case, um, saved by Mama Mitchum, um, as always, and that was really, really great that she <laughs> figured that out because I was really freaking out. And then we did kind of one last pass. I kind of collected myself and my purchases, saw a few other folks who had missed us on the patio, and then as I was leaving, ran into two great podcasters who I have really enjoyed watching. And, um, you know, they said, oh, are you Lily? And I said, yes, I watch your podcast <laughs> to them. <laughs> and it was really, really fun. It was a great, it was a great, like, you know, parasocial moment. And um, it was, it was just really special. So. I'll tag everybody who I can remember and put them down below. Thank you everyone who came up during Woolen Folk. It really was the kind of um, all in the family, like neighborhood kind of moment. And I really, really just deeply appreciated it. And I, I will say too that um, it was really cool to see how many people were talking with the the yarn dyers and talking with the makers and having it really more extensive conversations it didn't it was very full and very busy but it felt like at the root of that was real connection and yeah i was i wasn't sure if i should get into this now or later but i i do want to talk a little bit about the transformation and transition between these online relationships and online spaces and into reality and into our three-dimensional lived experience because for me it's really important and I think that there's a lot to be gained from that but it's not always a great fit to have them be so large for everyone's personality and I think that in and of itself is just something that we're aware of in this craft because it's solitary but we still crave connection like the act of this making can be very um, removed in some ways from others and very personal and that's one of the things that I think for me is actually one of the big draws right um, when I'm when I'm knitting I'm doing a, a, an activity in which I can kind of fully express myself and I'm not necessarily directly collaborating when I'm in the act of doing it and the act of making. And then we have these ways of connecting online through different mediums, mostly visual, where we can comment and create feedback on what things look like, right? 
And then <laughs> we have these like massive large gatherings where we have a chance to see things in person, to kind of run into people, to make meetups, to convene smaller groups together. And some people that really works for and some people it, it doesn't. But I do think that for me personally, I love that energy. I am definitely an extrovert. I definitely feel a deeper sense of connection to the craft and to others when I can be in those environments. And that doesn't mean it's not tiring or that it doesn't take a lot of effort or energy to engage in that way because, you know, I think it does for most folks. But for me, it's it's absolutely worth it and it feels really important to be part of something that is bigger than yourself but not just on a screen. That it that it is an embodiment and that you can kind of communicate, for me at least, I feel like I can communicate more fully when I'm in physical presence with others. So I definitely feel it more here through through video as well than just in kind of those flat lays that um, or kind of more posed pictures too. So anyway, these are just all things that I've been <laughs> thinking about a lot because I do feel like I've developed real relationships with folks through this medium and I, I want to keep doing that and I also want to be conscious of how that relates to who we are outside of these mediums and, and how we integrate these two kind of parts of ourselves. So anyway, that's just something that I've been thinking a lot about and, and was really nice to connect with other podcasters too and to see how they're navigating that situation as well and to communicate with them around those things so yeah it was, it was again like I think these are important questions to kind of all that they don't have answers right they're just here for us to work through together and to be in together and I really I really do appreciate that so I definitely spent the most time at Woolen Folk there were a ton of vendors. I didn't get to everyone I wanted to see, but I will, I guess, yeah, I'll talk about what I bought. Why not? I, and again, sorry if this is replay for folks who have already seen these things, but I went with the intention of visiting the Lamb and Kid in person um, for the Birdie base, which is their 40, no, sorry, 74% alpaca and 26% silk. It is a really, really wonderful base. And this is the color Volare. Again, something I'd kind of drooled at online, but didn't feel like I could commit to. Here we go. There it is. So I really wanted this object when I saw it online, but I was also really nervous about purchasing something of this kind of color, which is just seemed like I didn't, I really didn't know what it was gonna look like. So for me, this is really, again, important to see things in person. And when you're dealing with smaller vendors, I think that these bigger festivals are a way to have that interaction and to see those things. So this was first on my list. I knew I wanted to go there. I knew I wanted to see these colors in person. Knocked it out of the park. Very proud of myself for this. Uh, my plan for this Volare is a cumulus blouse. I think it's going to be a Christmas Eve cast on. I was recently watching a new to me podcast that I really enjoyed called the Sunday Knitting Society. And I think it was fed to me because of my massive fangirldom of the Serenity Knitting Society. <laughs> um, so it, it might have just been <laughs> that the algorithm thought that I liked things that were knitting societies, but this was a really fun podcast as well. And the, um, the, the channel creator had this wonderful idea where she casts on a garment on Christmas Eve and then works it up, um, and kind of really pays close attention to it and tries to finish by new year's. So when I heard that, I thought that would be a perfect way to complete this cumulus, um, blouse. And I think this would be a really wonderful colorway to have in January. Really soft, a little bit moody, but comforting as well. So I'm excited about that. And 
I went from there to the Magpie Fibers booth because there were a couple of colorways I was really keen to see in person there. Um, it was kind of a madhouse there, to be honest. It felt, a, that was the booth where I felt a little stressed out, where I was like, ugh, I don't like this. <laughs> this energy is like a little chaotic for me. And I think it was just the time of day or the moment of day that we were there. Um, maybe there was just happened to be a lot of people, but the, the colorways that I was interested in seeing in person were not that much different than what I expected them to look like based on what I saw online. And again, like that's part of the reason I wanted to go to these booths, right? Is to do my own kind of eye check and eye comparison. Like what, when I'm looking at this on a screen and I'm seeing this, like what does that actually look like in real life and how can I learn about these dyers and what their aesthetic is by actually seeing the work in person. Um, how does that kind of shift what I judge and what I might purchase online? So again, I think for me, super valuable. Um, from there though, we went to a not very populated booth, which was my, probably my personal favorite, a real find for me. This is Boondoggle Farms fin sport it's a hundred percent wool but it feels unreal it does not it does not feel like oh uh, it feels like it has silk content in it it really does it's got a beautiful shine to it it's absolutely stunning i am absolutely kicking myself slash murdering myself <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sorry, that was like very dark, but I, I'm so pissed that I didn't get more of this. I don't know what I was thinking. I was like, just such a fool. Each one of these skeins says right on here, 150 yards. Not a lot of yards, Lil. Not a lot of yards. Why would you think that you could make a sweater out of four skeins? That's nonsense. Nonsense. So I don't know what I was thinking. I did reach out to the maker. Unfortunately, she's completely sold out of this color, which is called silver because it's silver and beautiful and stunning. Um, and you know, I don't know if they'll have this exact blend. This is the natural color of the sheep. So who knows if it will be um, something that can be replicated. I'm pretty bummed about it, to be totally honest. I also got a really cute little hat kit from them. These little mini skeins. And they have some beautiful patterns. So I'm excited about that. Little, little, little hat. And I did get, so I got four. Is that right? I hope so. Oh no, did I just get three? No. Whew. Okay, so I got four in the silver color. Stunning. Then one in the white, or they call cream. Beautiful. And then one in the stone. And this is a very cool brown. It's, it is, I, I mean, you could probably call it gray, but I think it's more of like a cool brown. It's really cool. I, I love this. So now what I'm thinking is I go back to, um, I had thought I'd do a Dartmoor with this. Oh, that would be so amazing. I still really want a gray Dartmoor sweater, but I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, but I think I could get away with a three color color work yoke. So this would be my main color and then do color work with the white and the stone and then do the collar and sleeve cuffs and maybe hemline also in these. So I, I think I could still I think I could still get a sweater out of this, but really, I gotta say, yarn math is hard. <laughs> I always, and then, and then, what did I do next? Um, we went from that lovely booth, then we went to the Sonder Yarn Company booth, which was so nice. Um, they were selling it at String Theory, um, the String Theory booth was selling the Sonder yarn and it was all stunning. I mean, the colors really were beyond. Um, 
and I held back. I really could have gotten a sweater's quantity worth. Particularly, they have this really beautiful um, kind of hazy purple color, like a lilac, um, really blue purple that I'm super into right now. And I was very, very tempted, but I do have a lot of projects that I need to just kind of focus on. And I really felt like I want to, um, I want to make a few more neutral pieces to be totally honest. Like I think I've, I've got a lot of flash. I'm really attracted to yarn that's really bright and shiny. And so, or at least like strongly colored, has a strong color story. Yeah, you can see I'm still pulling this down. I'm going to look into editing and see how that works out. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I, I really do want to make some more neutrals, I think. But the, the booth was beautiful. The yarn was beautiful. Highly recommend. And I do think that the colors, though, are brighter in person to my eye then they appear in a lot of the social media and marketing posts. Um, they're very saturated, which I think comes through really well in those images, but I do think that the yarn itself um, has more luminosity. It's, it's just a little bit brighter, so I think that's a good thing. And yeah, definitely worth checking out. From there, we went to a couple other booths and touched a lot of yarn. <laughs> Um, but one of the things I had been hunting for and that I did put out as an intention for both days was to find a super punchy green and that brought me to ba -ba -da -bum. Hello Mellow and this super super bright fun green this is like a true Kelly green this is their DK I talk a lot about it in my last episode but I bought about twice what I'll need for the Marseille sweater. This will be my main color, the green. I don't know why I'm making trumpeting noises, excuse me. And then this dark navy, which is dyed on a brown base. So it comes out very deep. And wow, I'm loving this new camera. <laughs> this is really fun. Um, and the lighting's very good right now too. So those were my purchases. The venue itself, again, so beautiful. Being in nature in this really historic feeling site with folks from all over the country, all over the world was um, really remarkable. And it felt like a really kind of worth it event for me. And again, started me thinking about just how we interact together and what we, do on social media versus what we do in person. So it was really fun. It was just great to, to spend the time with my mom and connect with, with her and have these conversations together around kind of color and shape. And she, she held back very nicely, but she also has a couple of projects that she has told herself I need to, she needs to finish before she buys new yarn. And I think actually one of my, one of my favorite moments of the whole day was she was really tempted, I think, by a particular kit of a sweater that she'd been wanting to make for quite some time. And she just said, no, no, I've told myself, Lily, I'm only going to buy new, a new sweater's quantity of worth, worth, worth of yarn when I'm done with this sweater. And then this one woman just like hears us out of the corner of, you know, her eye, sees us out of the corner of her eye, hears what we're saying and turns around and said, well, haven't we all said that a hundred times? <laughs> and it was so sweet. We all just started laughing and I swear we like five minutes. I don't know who you are, but you're hilarious. Thank you. It was just perfect. It was wonderful. Um, so anyway, we drove back and just, it was really, really nice. Had a lovely um, last evening in our sweet farmhouse on Friday night for packing to leave on Saturday. So I didn't really do this properly, if I'm, if I'm gonna be honest. Like next year, I would definitely fly home on Sunday, but we had the whole family. We'd already been away for more than a week at this point. 
and we just felt like we needed that Sunday to kind of get our bearings back before sending the kids back to school and us going back to work on Monday. We just really felt like we needed it. So we f our, what we did and our plan was to fly out of uh, Newark in the evening on Saturday night. But, you know, Newark still, like, it is definitely one of the closest um, larger airports, but it's still like an hour and a half from Rhinebeck. So, and we were traveling with two small children and we wanted to get there really early. So we really did need to leave the main festival quite early on Saturday. So we got there right when it's, right about when it opened and it was so much fun. We went to the fairgrounds, super easy to park. And I'm so glad we parked where we did because we were right by the 4-H entrance. So there's a main entrance with a big barn but a little further down, there is a separate entrance, which is where all the um, livestock are. And so we got to go in that entrance and it was perfect. There, I, I needed one more cup of coffee and very luckily there were some wonderful 4-H youngsters who were selling and fundraising for their 4-H program with coffees and hot apple ciders. And it was so cute. And we just started, we started off the day just looking at animals with the kids and brought the whole crew. It was so fun and saw lots and lots of Alpenglows, lots of Rhinebeck sweaters, and lots of other things. Um, a lot of recognizable patterns, a lot of new to me patterns. I was definitely stopping folks and asking for yarn details and I was getting stopped a lot too. It was, it was just a great, um, morning really special and what did we do there oh um at a certain point i think after the second go through of the animal barns <laughs> with a three-year-old and a six-year-old i realized you know i actually wanted to look at some yarn and i was gonna have to peel off and and do it on my own so my mom and i peeled off and we went into a couple different exhibitor booths we didn't get to see everything at all and at this point i wasn't even really looking for materials or yarn um i had hoped to to find um dusty's vintage buttons but unfortunately i did not <laughs> um but i was really just impressed with the whole experience and I was you know it was like being at a I don't know romantic yarn lovers extravaganza I mean it was just a love fest there was so much positive positivity in the air so that was enough for me you know I really didn't feel like I needed to make any purchases but in walking through one of the exhibitor booths um, or, or barns my mom and I saw this incredibly beautiful very simple display of um, cashmere and everything was was schemed up in these beautiful little kits and I'm gonna show you here we go this is spring tide farm I don't know if you can see that oh it's way too shiny sorry but on the back you can see their lovely little cashmere goats Aren't they the cutest you've ever seen? It's just like, yes, of all the things, yes. And they had everything organized, all the materials organized for simple one and two skein projects. This is really fine fiber. And it, it, was, it was really beautiful. And it was also quite, I think, it felt restrained and very elegant. The presentation felt elegant. Um, one of the projects was a beautiful pair of finger knitless gloves that you would knit with just one skein. Um, my mom bought a really beautiful lace piece um, or a, the pattern and yarn to make a, a lace piece. And I fell hard for this cowl called Mindy's Fair Isle Cowl. And it's a pretty straightforward Fair Isle design. It's just beautiful it, and, and really simple. So it's Fair Isle on one side, stripes on the other, all done in the round and then seamed. And I bought 
this really nice taupe. And look at the drape. I mean, it's just beyond. It's, it is, it's just butter in your hand. It's so soft. And this is the natural color. So this is undyed. And um, it glows. It's just really beautiful. And I felt like, again, it was, it was kind of just subtle and quiet, but really powerful. And then I got this nice kind of purpley blue called Flavia as my contrast color. And I just think I'll wear it all the time. I'm really excited to make it. And I'm excited for it to be a really, I think it'll be a great travel knit and car knitting, frankly, because it's just easier to, to work on a smaller project, I think, um, when I'm on the train and in the car. So, and then, I, I, I don't know if I've done a very good job describing Rhinebeck itself, but outside of the barns, it was just like, you know, Disneyland for wool. Everyone was in a good mood. Um, there was a real sense of recognition, of care. I was really overwhelmed by the number of people. I don't think I expected just, or, or anticipated quite how big it was going to be, how full the space was going to feel. I was in awe of just the natural beauty of the space. You know, these green meadows and white fences and bright fluorescent orange trees. It was, it was really spectacular. And then everyone embodying their own colors and presenting what they were wearing was also really special. And then massive highlight for me too, is we were, the kids were starting to lose it. I'd gotten through, you know, a couple different vendor barns, but it was just, it was time to go. And next year I'll definitely give myself more time. But as we were leaving the fairgrounds, I ran into two of my favorite online front knitting friends, um, Anastasia and Jen. And it was so awesome to see them in person. I'd never met either of them in person. So that was fabulous. And we just, um, yeah, I was able to just kind of really, again, find that sense of interpersonal connection and, and embodied presence, which even if it's just for five minutes, I do think it really matters and it really, it feels different. And I'm really feeling super grateful that I was able to have the experience, but also super grateful that it, it was what it was based on my interactions online. So I think that if I didn't, had not had the community kind of built and, and kind of invested from the online perspective, I probably would have had a different experience at these events themselves. So I'm, I'm in by no means like, um, you know, saying anything negative at all about these online presences that we have because they are very real and they are very felt. And I feel super, super privileged to be able to interact with folks through all these different mediums and to get to learn so much not just about knitting, but about the way people live and, and how we can interact together in a really global way. So I am I really do think that these can feed each other and support each other. So it was just, it was just really special. So thanks for letting me pop on and ramble about a trip I took, I guess that's what I did, but I'm, just so delighted to share with you always. And yeah, that's what we're doing, right? We're putting ourselves out there and whether that's physically in person at in-person events or virtually, or just inserting our needle and making one stitch at a time, um, we're really putting ourselves out into the world. So thank you all. So appreciate you and I'll be back soon with some uh, hopefully finished other finished objects and some more nitty chat. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you soon. Bye.